Sí. <laughs> Last time I did that, something happened. Okay, so Alisa emailed me. She's in. She just yeah. got in. Yeah. Okay, wonderful. We are uh, getting our numbers back. Good. That's encouraging. Right. Well, yeah. I mean, those numbers seemed inflated a little bit, you know. <laughs> as much as my ego got some some some, some type of a boost, <laughs> I realized the num I realized the numbers were a bit inflated. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So okay, um, I'm going to start. Whoever comes in um, late, I'm happy to rerun maybe, but uh, for an extra no no extra just in general for a fee. <laughs> 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 there is okay. So without further ado, again thank you very much for all the patience and understanding, and I'll try to uh, make it you know, worthwhile. Now if um, at any point, there's something specific. If I go too fast, um, I'm, I plan for about 40 minutes, but who knows? Uh, sometimes we get too, too attached to one slide. But I do have a kind of packed presentation here because there's a lot to cover. Uh, first, there was a request from, from the school, from Henry George School, to reflect on, um, in general, yeah, it's kind of related with what's going on in the book, but also reflect on, um, uh, in general, some provide some background, some history, right? And um, uh, that's number one. Second, obviously, there's, you know, the crisis we're dealing with, and that should be a part of the conversation. Um, and then going back to more kind of general uh, discussion in terms of, well, what can be done? What are some of the uh, sort of specific trends that we could be paying attention to? And uh, I apologize, I'm going to be sometimes looking at my phone because, you know, with the technical questions to see if we don't, that we don't miss anyone's attempt to trying to get in. So I'm getting, I'm receiving emails. But okay, um, so here's uh, where I'd like to start. I, I usually start with, with a map uh, in all of my classes, but also my academic presentations as well. And uh, this is only, uh, the purpose of this is, is only to impress upon everyone uh, the scale, uh, sort of the vastness of the territory, um, but also it's sort of incredible diversity that we are talking about. So, and that kind of brings me to the very first point about the transition economies. Um, and uh, uh, somebody challenged me recently about this. Maybe it was somewhere in public, I don't remember. Uh, but basically why call transition economies if sort of you, you think it's, um, do you think it's sort of an appropriate uh, term? Well, first, of course, let, let me step back. First, of course, so we, we're talking about, by this count, about 29 individual countries that have appeared on the map um, pretty much out of nowhere from a perspective of um, economic development sort of views and established economic development views. My point is really to bring them back into, or not even back, but to integrate uh, the conversation uh, on the economic prospects of these countries into the field of economic development and obviously then into the policy. Okay, so, but then um, we are again familiar with what happened and this is just a big picture view. On average, there was a massive uh, drop through the 90s as we went through the reforms. Uh, the uh, uh, sort of switching from or that word again, transitioning from the um, planned economy into market-oriented economy. Um, it took about, well, 10 years at best, uh, on average, uh, 14 years, more or less, depending on st statistics, but directionally, more than 10, a decade, um, to get back to the levels of the pre-reforms um, uh, overall GDP, right? So this is why the word transition uh, is probably a, a, a misnomer, and that's why I use transformation in the title, and then go on deeper in the book, talking about how it was really a fundamental um, economic, social, political, and cultural transformation. So it was all out change that was really profound. And when we, were, when we sometimes use the word uprooted and sort of describing certain events and such, that was the situation because all, sort of overnight and historical time was pretty much within seconds, 
the world that people lived in all of a sudden disappeared and they had to figure out how to live in, in under new conditions. Now, of course, people adapt and, you know, we can, there's, there's tons of positive outcomes, which we will uh, touch on, but it is also important to, to learn some of the difficult lessons. Um, these days, you know, uh, quoting someone famous, there's always some danger that, you know, you're not using the right quote, but I thought I'd go with more or less generally accepted states, <laughs> statesmen, <laughs> as I used their quotes in the books. And the one I liked really uh, was uh, by one of the several, you'll see a few, um, was this one by Churchill, the second one. We shape our buildings and afterwards our buildings shape us. And to me, this appropriately, appropriately, appropriately captured what happened as far as the socialist, um, um, well, the history, right? I don't want to use the words experiment or project. So as a socialist economy um, evolution from its beginnings uh, to more or less maturity, but you know, you could be mature, but it doesn't really often end up being something um, uh, stable, right? So it's some maturity, some growth, and then eventual uh, dismantling of the whole thing. So what were the buildings in this case? Well, the buildings were the big slogans, right? The, the whole society was moving towards communism. The whole idea was to build a whole, a, a new world, an entirely uh, 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 different from everything that had existed before uh, with uh, you know, all the concepts that we refer today as human rights and such and such to be considered. Um, and that was the promise, right? And this is very important. Very often we find in literature people referring to these countries as communist. There was communist party, of course, there, but technically they were socialist because socialism was a step before communism. One could come up with a lot of jokes if we have the time, maybe we'll come back, come back to this. But here's a poster from 1939 that really captures the whole essence of what would be happening to the next, um, how many, 60, well, no, uh, 50 years or so, right? Um, this train is moving from socialism, station socialism to the station communism. And these are the leading, um, you know, the drivers of the locomotives. Um, so there was a lot of ideology, but it was also this declaration that this, what, we're move, what the countries were moving towards to uh, was something better. With, so that's the building in the Churchill's quote. But it also means that you have now to conform to the structure of this new building, or in this case, the principle, the slogan, right? And that meant that if you announced that under socialist or communist uh, environment, um, there will be more justice, there will be more access for people to you know, things that matter today, such as healthcare and education, or social support, you better provide that because you know, no matter how you control people, these are the things that would be important as kind of as a uh, as a performance um, comes in <laughs> performance review comes in eventually, and so that's exactly what happened, right? Um, following very difficult years of nineteen uh, twenties, nineteen thirties, then the war of nineteen through uh, you know, World War Two, and uh, out of that, within the Soviet Union for now, comes out a new model of uh, society, new model of economy. The economy clearly is centrally um, uh, organized and, and controlled, um, but the society enjoying, uh, uh, I would use that word, enjoying uh, significant uh, um, sort of strong and, and significant deep safety nets in terms of uh, certain what we call non-wage goods provisions, right? So then by the time we get into the 50s and the uh, addition of the Eastern European countries or Central uh, European as my colleagues from that part of the world would prefer to be geographically identified, um, the, sort of the attempts to um, uh, sort of bring them within uh, the, the realm, right, within the control of the, of the socialist system, were actually initially not so clearly cut out uh, in the blueprint. There's quite significant literature, which actually comes from American researchers working through the archives, suggesting that in the first couple of years, it was 
part, kind of that period of uh, indecision when, you know, obviously Stalin at the head of the Soviet Union um, was n unsure about, well, how things would go. And it's really important to keep this in mind that a lot of the enthusiasm for this kind of the socialist project, which seemed very progressive at the time, uh, came from uh, sort of from um, from the people, um, from the majority, supporting uh, the resistance against the Nazis uh, in the war. And Yugoslavia would be the perfect example of this because the, the, you know, Joseph Tito would rise to become uh, the uh, sort of this symbol of Yugoslavia from the beginning uh, after World War II up until his death in 1980. Um, and uh, another researcher, Ivan Berendt, actually said what kept uh, the Yugoslavian Federation together was uh, Tito's, Tito's army, his authority, and, uh, and himself in, in general. Um, but what happens in 1950s in those countries, in Central Europe, is also very significant. The Soviet Union went through massive industrialization, but that was very brutal industrialization, and the human toll that it took must not be forgotten, although development economists refer to this as a very interesting experiment. Again, any, every time I see the word experiment, I try to avoid for, sort of extending the conversation. But in this case, and this is why I'm kind of spending so much time on this, it was really significant because um, a sort of, it was a counterbalance, uh, a counter response to what we know as Marshall Plan in Western Europe, right? Only obviously with uh, somewhat probably different technology, but the end result of it is relevant for, for us today. And that's what I wrote this whole thing in Financial Times about that the roots of uh, the successful integration in the European economy in the, through the 90s were really planted in the 1950s. And what these figures indicate is the share of investment and, 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 and increase in sort of production indexes um, across these countries before and after the war. All right, and much of it was financed through uh, the Soviet Union, but was also was, what was also coming uh, was the access to resources, you know, the oil, commodities, and such. And again, in, in the literature, uh, again, that was more is focused in the United States, by, by mid-1980s, there was a, quite a bit of a discussion of so-called um, energy subsidy, right? Um, that uh, the sort of, the, the, they were, uh, the, the transfers were um, kind of the commodities flowing from the East to, to, the, to the Eastern European economies uh, were to sustain those countries and keep them kind of happy within the socialist model. But it allowed, it gave this push for uh, development. However, if that might have sounded a bit too positive, that I did not mean it really, but it was significant progress. And there's an interesting uh, literature that is appearing these days on that. Now, back to presentation. But what happens next is really unexpected, right? We see um, two really uh, drops. One is from 1980 to 1990, and then through the 90s. Well, we can explain probably through the 90s and blame shock therapy and this dismantling of the centralized economy. Now, this probably would have been expected because, okay, you have a, the whole system that is centralized, controlled, um, certain things have been worked out and they just keep running. And once you abruptly stop it, it's sort of like that locomotive, right? The train, um, the, you know, the, the train cars will start piling up on, it, upon each other. So the second one is probably understandable. But the first one is not so clear. Why would there be a breakdown in the uh, common market? So now we have Central Europe and former Soviet Union on average, but also we can see in individual countries. Why would there be an economic slowdown um, um, even before the reforms? And it turns out what was missing in 19, through the 1970s and 1980s was the um, uh, lack of a technological upgrade or capital reinvestment, right? In other words, if you believe in the long wave theories, which are very interesting, I have a paper on this, we can talk about that another evening, but the, there's an interesting idea there that suggests that at a certain period of time, 50 years to 70 years, there's going to be some sort of a major breakdown uh, in the economic conditions. And a lot of people are looking at what's going on now uh, in that relation as well. But back then, 
1970s would be the, also the period of that maturation that I mentioned, the maturity of the socialist system. It had become so complex, so massive and difficult to navigate that uh, eventually it started to uh, sort of slow down. Now the lesson from this is, and break down, break apart. So the lesson pro from this is probably that at the very beginning of development, a state, a consolidated state action probably helps grow uh, economies to grow and get to the industrial level of competitive uh, sort of, or uh, to a competitive industrial level uh, on a global uh, basis. But at a certain point, the state, as the sort of omnipresent government, should realize that now is the time to step back and allow competition. Um, and then it's up to the politicians to decide probably which sectors in combination with economists. But uh, in other words, gradually release this hold over, over the economy. Well, that did not happen clearly. And the, the sort of despite all the grand achievements of 1950s, which were really posted high growth rates and, and, and sort of there's much more optimism at the time, even more than the 1930s, um, that opportunity was lost, right? Because pretty much the Soviet Union followed the very, a very American saying, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. <laughs> it didn't feel like something was broken. It felt like things should be just going the way they, they are. So, um, um, let me just pause for a moment. Ibrahim, are, uh, are we recording? Yes, we are recording. Okay. Uh, just, okay. Well, then, I just wanted to add something for the record, really. Because with all this uh, complex macroeconomic discussion, I think what really is important to consider is the effect of my favorite, the Beatles. <laughs> there is a, another... A, uh, uh, kind of perspective to all of this. And it's, it's the one that comes from the culture. It comes from, here's what regular people want. And they wanted to be able to listen to the Beatles. They wanted to be able to listen to Led Zeppelin and so on, whatever was popular by 1970s. The, the society was so sophisticated at the time um, in many ways uh, with uh, educational levels, with uh, development and social services. Um, yet the Beatles were not allowed behind the Iron Curtain. And by the way, the term Iron Curtain was first used by um, a British um, sort of uh, socialist, Ethel Snowden, in 1920, when she took a made a trip to, um, at, then, at that time, Soviet Russia, and then she wrote her memoirs. In any case, the Beatles played a major role, and uh, there's this uh, film which I... I encourage everyone to watch because it really tells the story of the underground um, sort of the music movements uh, in, 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 in the major cities and how that raised a generation of, uh, of different people who were trying to find alternative views. It also probably part of the reason why the moment things started to open up, uh, the, uh, Western culture uh, really uh, uh, flooded and became dominant and also it kind of creates this uh, um, subconscious feeling probably and desire for people to okay what do we need to get to that level okay we need the market economy so let's forget whatever we had and work on getting market economy uh, uh, to, uh, to bring in right so now most recently though the results show that even though perhaps one could say there were some happy times, especially if you ask uh, some of the older generation. Uh, they would recall the 1970s and, and 1980s, I'm not going to say go further, but 1970s, 1980s is relatively stable period of time domestically, internally. Okay, this is nothing to say about what was going on outside, but internally, domestically, life was built in a very predictable way. Um, Unfortunately, once the system started to break down and um, you know, now each country is, is becoming individual, uh, an individual family, it's pursuing its own ideas and goals, it didn't work that out uh, that nicely as, as was expected. Um, on this chart, this line is really the 1989 uh, GDP per capita level and the bars indicate 
different countries and sort of the years when they reached uh, the uh, climbed back to 1989 levels. The general story is that it took quite a few countries much longer than um, one would have expected or longer than the reforms uh, would have predicted. And we see that some of the countries, Ukraine, Georgia, the Czechoslovakia, Moldova, as were still below that level on the per capita on the per capita terms. So this is quite a significant uh, gap in development, and this is another reason why I'm trying to kind of uh, uh, emphasize that this should the, the what happened what in the 90s and the transition. Let's just go with the common term that these countries have gone through should be part of uh, de development economics curricula, curriculum, not just a paragraph on the difference between socialist and capitalist economies, which we have in most macroeconomic textbooks. So we can come back to this chart, but to impress you even more and very quickly, because I have a lot of these pictures, uh, look at the blue line and the, uh, the kind of the brown, brown line. These are basically employment to population uh, ratios, right? Compared to Western Europe and, and, and the United States. And, um, you know, one could explain the percentages based on aging population or migration, but there's also very clear picture of a simply disappearance of employment. Remember the system was, uh, the, the idea behind socialist system was um, what we call today job guarantee, right? So Pavlina wrote that very interesting book, but it is essentially the system that prevailed uh, for the most time and um, with the guaranteed employment opportunities for college graduates. Um, now that disappears, right? And so we have this massive fold and barely any recovery um, up until now. So that's important. And that leads to the next point and the point on sort of the social implications of uh, this. Um, again, colorful picture, focus on the, of course, intended for much longer <laughs> analysis, but very briefly in the presentation, focus on the dark uh, blue uh, bars and the light blue bars. Essentially what this is saying is that anywhere between 40 to 60% of national income is controlled between uh, or accru accrues uh, anywhere to uh, the richest 20% or, or the sort of the richest 40% uh, population group, right? So this is basically the story of worsening income inequality. Yet, this is within each country, right? Intra-country comparisons. But if we compare these countries to, or some of these countries rather, I should say, to uh, Western European economies or advanced economies, actually we will find a slightly a uh, uh, sort of better uh, interpretation for this story. And we will see that on the cross-country comparison, the Eastern European countries and some of the former Soviet Union uh, countries are doing relatively better than um, Western European countries or other advanced economies. And, and the reason for that is, uh, all, is also partially the preservation of some of those safety nets that I talked about earlier. Um, you know, a little bit more uh, generous pensions, um, the regulation uh, in terms of labor and paid time off, these type of things, um, uh, sort of paid sick leave that um, we think is an, an atrocity, but it's kind of <laughs> an accepted uh, uh, way of things. Now, um, of course, with each country is different and the stories are different, but relatively speaking, they're, they're a little bit more of these type of protections. Now, what was, uh, this, the story would not be complete if we don't also mention another big factor, and that is the factor of migration. Uh, what these bars pointing downwards uh, are showing, is, so the blue bars ref refer to the period of the decade of 1990s, and then the, the orange dots are the 2002 through 2012 years. And uh, they indicate the rates of migration, right? So basically whatever is negative means people are leaving the country. And we see there that in the Caucasus and, or in Bosnia and Herzegovina, right? The, 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 sort of the Balkan countries, the countries that went either through the war, countries that are, are structurally um, uh, not 
sort of strongly really developed and then sort of weaker have seen um, um, a significant migration of people leaving those countries. Um, there is also, if you look at Central Asian countries, for example, Kazakhstan, uh, what also matters is the um, sort of something that is, and this is why Rick, when we talked about the Velvet Revolution, that was the Czech Republic and Slovakia was really the only, uh, the, the Velvet Revolution. Everywhere else, those changes were very violent, right? And so part of this migration is not just due to lack of jobs, but also due to political instabilities and, and rising ethnic co conflicts. Now, much coming much more uh, closer to our time these days, what we find um, are the two dependencies, right? And those are, uh, the dependency is one dependency on exports and the other dependency on labor migrants remittances. The second connects with what I just talked about, about migration, but the exports is really about exports of commodities, exports of uh, various services, um, or um, reliance on tourism. Today I read about the Republic of Georgia offering special kind of visas for anyone who would move there to work for a long term. Um, and uh, you know, it's a picturesque place. There is Black Sea, which is probably the best in the world. So definitely if, if that's on your mind, you should move uh, or at least take up uh, that opportunity. Um, but it's probably not going to be that many people, right? So as far as generating sustainable income or economic activity, uh, uh, it's probably going to be minor, although it does add to the country's image. Um, but it, it, the country does depend a lot on tourism and uh, other countries depend a lot on commodities. Now with this pandemic, um, there's decline in everything. Now on remittances, again, and I'm going through this very briefly, I realize, but on remittances, just to indicate how important they are, these are averages, right? So it's mis this is covering up some of the years when um, for certain countries, they would be really high. For example, for Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan remittances are in double digits as far as their GDP and for Tajikistan about 35%, the latest for the past 10 years. But if we take a specific year, it goes all the way up to 40%. Um, for Armenia, it would, would go up to 20% for any specific year, but on average about 16 and so on. Um, now, it's not a common story, right? The remittances, they're just specific countries that have seen this massive loss of population. Um, I'm going to come back to something a bit later. I'm going to, in the interest of time, um, but I'll I'd rather, I'll come back to remittances a bit later uh, when I talk about um, diaspora. Again, this was um, a request uh, to include that in the presentation, so I will touch on that a little bit. Um, other than exports of uh, either raw materials or agricultural commodities, most recently, there has been an attempt to discover other ways that would sort of um, uh, help uh, grow the economies and um, uh, kind of capitalize on the legacy, which was the Soviet legacy, of uh, very strong educational systems, specifically technical education, right? I mean, there are villages that you go to and you see some sort of ruins. So there was a building once upon a time there. And it's a very remote village, barely cell phone connection. And you ask, well, what are the, the sort of, what is, what is that building that, that's uh, sitting there for probably two decades and no one has done anything with it? And the answer would be, oh, they used to make optical devices in this village. So the, the way this Soviet system was set up was to ensure this employment that in the rural areas where very little would be grown, so to substitute for income, these type of things would be created. Um, so it's quite interesting and you know how it worked, but obviously it was not really sustainable. In any case, what's happening now is that a lot of countries are trying to uh, uh, capitalize on what, what sort of uh, the remnants of that legacy. And this is where the focus on innovation comes in. I mean, Estonia is really known as the electronic uh, country of the world, right? With the electronic IDs, uh, that carry all of the information. Um, you know, we go to see doctors and such, and they give you 10 pages of paper to fill out, even though 
you had filled out something online just two days ago, but they say it was still needed in paper. Well, in Estonia, apparently, all you need is just an ID and that reads all of your data and, and you're fine. Uh, the same ID could be used in the, the for various registrations and, and to pay things and so on. Very comfortable. But what also comes from Estonia is Skype, Ibrahim, and maybe we can use that as a backup next time. <laughs> and also an idea for e-residency. So if anyone is dreaming about setting up a business in the European Union, all you need to do is to apply for Estonia's e-residency and through that you can open up your online company. If you've ever used Prezi for your presentation, that's from Hungary. Um, Czech Republic, Slovakia, Poland, they're very big on cybersecurity right now. Pex Art is something like Instagram, but apparently more for professional <laughs> editing. That's from Armenia. Another thing from Armenia that <clears throat> I haven't used yet, but it's called Crisp. And that is supposed to be a noise reduction <coughs> app that could be integrated with Skype and other things. In other words, there's very strong emphasis on this whole IT sector, obviously, and the pandemic is pushing this even further and kind of, uh, brought it up to surface. But the problem is that to work in, in, in the sector, you need education or access to learn how to work in the sector. And what, what I, what I found, I was looking at the World Bank report, so it's probably difficult to see what this, is that the ICT is really just two, three percent of total employment in the overall pool of employment. And in this case, I'm looking at Armenia, um, but it, it is often portrayed as one of the leading uh, countries uh, pushing for technological development. And there was actually the World Technology Congress took place um, in October over there. Now, my interest is also on, on these small countries, as obviously I've mentioned uh, here, and I will talk about some of the other um, kind of forces that uh, shape uh, um, those countries' development in, in a few moments. But let's talk about it now, what's going on right now, especially with pandemic, now that hopefully I've sketched more or less contours of the big picture, uh, some of the past trends, some of the current challenges, and here's yet another quote. This one is from Aristotle about the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. I'll leave this one to interpretation, but let me talk about <laughs> some of the numbers that we've got. With the help of um, actually one of the interns at Henry George School, um, Kuba Tsitsinski, to whom I'm really thankful, we've put together um, some details on the COVID-19 19 crisis in, um, in uh, transition economies. So the information comes from different sources and we're actively working um, on that. We actually put together a tracker for some of the leading economies and you can find that on, okay, it's a plug, Henry <laughs> George School website. Um, but back to my story, here's an anticipation and this is quite um, um, symptomatic in terms of the the work that economists are doing these days. So what is expected as far as uh, real GDP growth, right? We will expect a, a recession. We expect a, a severe recession in some cases. So um, Georgia is expected to drop 4.4%, Russia 4.9%, Ukraine 5.3%. But what's really um, curious, right, uh, to, in, in this way, is the positive numbers and the recovery in 2021. So this follows pretty much the IMF uh, format, which they set in, in their uh, spring update to the World Economic Outlook, where they had a massive decline projected for this year and really sharp increase in the next year. But as Keynes properly said, we simply do not know if we talk about the future. So we're yet to discover how things work out, but I'm always thinking positively. I'm hoping for the best. But for now, what this crisis has uncovered are the structural vulnerabilities that had existed there before, but maybe were masked by uh, you know, the general environment of growth and, and there, another factor which I'll bring up in, in, in a second. What is, what's also became evident is this, the, the, to the degree of reliance, the high degree of reliance on exports, and that's why I brought it up earlier, right? Also the integration with the main economy in the region. So for many of these, it's the integration with Russia or reliance on the Russian economy and, and then the Russian business cycle. 
So whenever uh, there's something happening in the world that is negatively affecting, um, let's say, a Russian consumer or Russian production, it also has repercussions for the smaller economies in the region. And um, you know, to suggest for these economies, well, just reorient your exports to European Union is really wishful thinking and, and a disservice to those economies because it's, you know, there are regulatory concerns on the European Union side in terms of what can be brought in and so on. At, at least that, and not to talk about all sorts of transportation and logistical issues. Um, we, in all of the economies, we've seen rise in unemployment, we've seen decline in investment, decline in consumer spending. Plus, for the remittances dependent economies, there's clearly anticipated, the data is still coming in, uh, negative effects on remittances. In Central and Eastern Europe, the story repeats itself, but over there, the, the reliance is not on Russian economy, but on the European Union economy. And things I think are going to be a little bit more difficult in this case, actually, because there's increased talk about the national economy model in France, for example, and what this basically means is that we should limit to the extent to which we rely on um, others and try to figure out what can be produced domestically. Now, this whole national economy idea may repeat itself in other places as well, but for the Central and Eastern European economies that are tightly integrated into the European Union supply chain, it may become a bit of uh, quite of a serious problem, right? So, something to keep in mind. Here's what helped before the crisis, and now is becoming a little bit, uh, quite a bit of a problem, and that is reliance on external funding. Um, at the peak of 2008 crisis, Chuck Prince of Citigroup said, as long as the music played, we danced, right? So as long as the money was flowing in terms of uh, new sovereign debt or other portfolio investments, financial deepening, so to speak, was, you know, was ongoing. Right, and so uh, the chart, I keep pointing at this as if I'm look, uh, talking to the board, but <laughs> you should use my pointer. But this chart includes just emerging markets, but, and I circled some of the uh, transition economies here. And um, we see that there's a at least projected increase in um, debt and um, further worsening fiscal deficits. Now, with that also comes really, with that really comes the high share of debt ownership by foreign investors. Again, a lot of information, but so I'm only pointing out the, the key points here. High debt and most of that debt is owned by foreign investors. Even though it may be local currency debt, the fact that it's owned by uh, foreign investors probably has to worry uh, uh, the, the countries that are issuing that debt or considering to issue new debt. Um, because we saw in March and April how uh, the um, sort of the reversals of flows can be very sudden with over $100 billion of leaving, <coughs> um, leaving uh, uh, the, um, uh, the, the emerging markets. Now, <coughs> let's move on. So what is being done, right? And... Um, one second, Ibrahim, I received one request for to log in. So I'm going to interrupt this here. Uh, and, yes. Okay. So what is being done? And this is really where Cuba is really instrumental in helping to put this together. Uh, we rely on the IMAPS uh, recovery uh, or re policy response tracker. And this is the same one that we used for the Henry George schools um, uh, tracker that we put online as well. But this one looks at the Eastern European former Soviet Union countries. Um, so we have the fiscal stimulus, we have the salary policy, social policy, cash benefits, monetary policy, and GDP per capita, just to give an idea as far as comparison. So clearly COVID is a shock um, and it's testing resilience of domestic economies. It's testing the resilience also of the international trade connections. Will, they be, uh, will the trade be carried over with closed borders and how and so on, right? So um, as far as fiscal stimulus that's been announced, that's known estimates are around, let's say on average 3%, right? With some of 
the countries like Poland, Serbia having a bit more. Um, as far as social policy, uh, there's an attempt to increase benefits, but we should keep in mind that you know, the, the resources are very limited um, in those countries. And um, there's been more emphasis on loans uh, rather than grants, right? So loans still come with an obligation of repayment. So there's some conditionalities there. Um, but, you know, just like an experience anywhere else, pretty much, um, probably with exception of the, the good stories we hear from examples in the European Union of the of Spain, France, Germany, every, but pretty much everyone is in this and, and, and is dealing with this crisis to the best extent they, they can. Um, but there may be generous uh, support provided at, at the moment, right, for another few months. But if this, God forbid, continues, it would be very difficult to sustain the same level of resources. And we see, uh, you know, strong really calls and preference to open up um, and, and understandably so, right? But the resilience is not just, should be seen as uh, an economics or a con of, of economics, right? It, it is also a concept of social resilience, how society responds to crisis, and also healthcare resilience. So to that, I have another story where I'll just summarize by saying that, um, and that was in another brief write-up that I did, that this crisis is truly the first global crisis. Um, Great Depression, covered pretty much all of the world, but it left the Soviet Union in a relatively better position than others. 1930s was the time when um, industrialization was pushing through and uh, we, you know, with all those massive achievements and results, with some of those power stations that were built back then are, that are still functioning on roads and so on. The 1990s crisis, uh, in Eastern Europe and Soviet Union, former Soviet Union, uh, was really contained to that uh, region, but gave massive boost to the economies of Western Europe and uh, North America with the discovery of new consumer market. That was, so that was quite a significant um, um, aspect as well. So now there's this uh, global crisis, which in my opinion requires a global response. So, um, I can come back to this if anyone is interested, would like to talk more about this, uh, but I have a few more things prepared and I'm looking at the time, if I may have another five minutes or so, um, just to talk through what Ibrahima asked me to uh, really add to this presentation and emphasize another story. So, the, and this is the story of diaspora. And um, for the Eastern European former Soviet Union countries, uh, the diaspora plays a role slightly different in a different and in a different context than uh, we may think about sort of so diasporas that are formed by, let's say, labor migrants, right? But first of all, why is this even uh, a topic? Well, in, it's become, it has grown to become a new um, source of possible and potential um, source of growth and uh, often discussed in uh, economic development context. And specifically, there are several proposals. One proposal is to just rely on remittances, right? And maybe a sustained development finance effect. The problem with that view, uh, let me just present the view and then try to uh, dispel it or, <laughs> or explain it a little bit more. But the problem with the remittances view is that um, when we look at the number in total, and there's something, let's say, 600 billion a year, um, it's really massive and it's impressive. But when you start looking at individual country, you realize that remittances really depend on two things. Um, on, on first, on the country level, it's the number of labor migrants that are working outside of the country. So the more the the more that are out there, the more in terms of funding goes back to the home country. But the other factor is more common um, and does not, uh, is not a function of the size of the economy. But the second factor is that as long as there's a receiver in the home country, remittances are coming through. 
the moment the family joins the breadwinner abroad, um, there's a cutoff of that channel. All right, so remittances, as grand as they are, as so you probably have seen charts with the lines growing, and a lot of people trying to convince that this is the growth source that is, that is untapped, are very unstable and unpredictable, plus they go mostly towards immediate consumption, rather than, and, and consumption to consumer uh, uh, sort of goods and such, rather than going into the broader uh, economy in a more structural way. Diaspora bond it, it has been occupied the minds of um, development economists since Israel tried it in the 1950s, but that's really the only successful example that is systematically organized, well-structured, transparent, follows certain rules, has clear uh, targets, goals, and, and, uh, and, has, and the country has sufficient financial deepening and capital to, uh, to run this system. The countries that we're talking about don't really have this, even though it's been on their mind for quite a while. The Asper microloans, those seem to be working, but th those are one-off sort of uh, attempts by people living abroad trying to bring money in for specific projects. And then there's talk about the soft skills transfers. Well, probably now with a lot of webinars and I've participated in some, um, uh, that could become a, a, a more of a reality. But again, what's missing really is a systemic engagement infrastructure, something that would kind of help channel that untapped resource um, into where it's needed the most and in terms of the governments or countries' prior development priorities. Ultimately, there's talk about repatriation in some countries, but it's going to be more of an immigration uh, in many cases, as people are moving back to the countries that they don't even recognize anymore. Um, my two proposals on diaspora regulatory mechanism and migration development bank are aimed to sort of uh, streamline the migration flows and uh, and the remittance flows. So something like in this picture, uh, where we have the home country up at the top with the sort of the entire a structure with labor migrant recruiting agency the consulate and then we have the foreign country this is where the migrant is going to so we have here a diaspora center located in the foreign country an employer who is in contact and has some type of a contractual relationship with that center and all of this of course requires bilateral agreement at the political level at the country level and the migration development bank is then aimed to provide to be this financial transfer mechanism for remittances so that they enter the system, the home economy, not on ad hoc basis, but in a more systemic basis, predictable basis, because it raises also questions about not just how the money is spent, but also the exchange rates and monetary policy. And for a lot of the receiving countries, there's very strong reliance on imports, right? So at the same time, they're uh, commodity exporters. How do you maintain a competitive currency value so that you don't choke off the exports, but at the same time, um, people have sufficient enough of purchasing power remaining with the imports? So it's a very difficult question, and that's why I think it needs to be brought into more sort of the monetary policy roles. And one way I thought about doing this is to set up, suggest a set up of special entity. But I talked about home versus diaspora a little bit. There's really a question about who makes the first move, who opens up to whom first. I think both should. But what's really interesting and different, as I mentioned just a few minutes ago, from other examples of diaspora that people talk about, in the context of Eastern Europe and former Soviet Union, is this difference between the old and the new diasporas. This is especially uh, visible in the case of um, former Soviet Union countries. Uh, Russia, with its vastness, has, is a home to uh, several dozens of uh, ethnicities. I, I, I'm forgetting the number, 140-something, right? Um, and um, this sort of, these ethnic identification, national identifications, are quite important, and, and, they're, and they're relevant still. Um, even though ancestors may have moved to Russia from whichever country 
I don't know, two generations ago, right? So that would be the old diaspora. And the new diaspora are the, is really formed by the migrants who had moved through the 90s. There's a, lot, there, there's a lot to be unpacked here in terms of how they connect with each other. Um, the old diaspora is usually more affluent than the new diaspora. What are the educational level differences and so on? How do they communicate with their home country? The old diaspora may not have such a strong connection, but they realize, well, there's that home country out there. So it, it can get very deep and, and difficult um, to unpack in two minutes. So let me just continue. Um, well, I'm going to skip some of the slides, but what I tried to do to understand this, in the specific case of Armenia, I did a survey on the diaspora and just collected the data to see what would be the sort of signals to engage. And uh, what I talked about as far as the lacking engagement infrastructure, that was pretty much the outcome. In other words, people living in the United States who were born here, grew up here, but have some type of connection with, uh, emotional connection um, uh, with, so Armenia, they would like to contribute somehow to the country. Um, all right, maybe enough on this. I have a very, uh, I have another chart, but I'll skip this one. Let me tr not try to draw some conclusions. And that's the long view, I call it. And for the long view and for conclusions, we must rely on philosophers and there's no one better than Georg Hegel. <laughs> a very difficult quote to understand, but pretty much says that it's not just the result that counts, but it's the path towards this result. And I think that's very important to understand when we talk about this group of countries. We cannot simply start talking about them, at least in my opinion, and that's my very strong opinion, cannot simply start talking about them as here they are, and let's just look up in the textbook what the model applies to them, and let's just say, why, don't, why can't you be like that? There's history, and that history really matters. So, what, so that if you're struggling to understand why is this country behaving in a certain way, or why is there a conflict between these two countries, or why wouldn't something that seems to be acceptable across all of Europe is not so acceptable somewhere in Poland and all that. I didn't want to use any specific country, but somewhere else, right? And the answer is it's, it's deep-seated seated his, history um, that really uh, formulates and, uh, uh, sort of those uh, decisions in, in economic policy and social and politics. And so if the ultimate goal was of the reforms was to reach the average levels of OECD uh, income countries, then <clears throat> that is yet to happen, right? So we see that some of the countries are approaching, but really they're, they're not there yet. And the crisis may, this crisis may throw us back uh, uh, even more. Um, again, the results will be uneven between across the countries. Overall, I sometimes call this as accidental progress in terms of what happened in the 90s because um, the, the 20th century and the sort of the dominance and control of the Soviet Union over uh, that of the socialist system, uh, Soviet social system over that region um, was definitely restricting uh, obviously various freedoms, but at the same time it laid that economic foundation and the political foundation that by 1990s allowed each of those countries to declare independence. Um, and this work is researched more, I guess, uh, among historians and, and I'm influenced by those views rather than economists. Um, but on a, a last couple of things. Um, so for me, the way I read these countries and in general economic development is structured by this sort of spiral uh, movement um, of three uh, uh, among three uh, key points, right? It's the competitive economic structure, it's the institutional change, and the social welfare. There was a survey uh, done a couple of years ago by EBRD, European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, that looked at the happiness levels, with, which could count as social welfare, between Eastern Europe and Western Europe, and they said. For the first time since 1990s, we see that the two are approaching each other. However, they, the authors of the, of the report said, we are not really sure uh, 
Is it because Eastern Europe is still doing better or is it because Western Europe is depressed because of the sluggish recovery after the 2008 crisis? But these type of indicators would be relevant uh, to take into consideration, right? So and it could be more than just the happiness index, uh, human development index is one. The institutional change, not on paper, but as far as the practice, and this is where I'm reminded of late Yegor Gaidar's comment uh, in his later works, uh, in the name we should, his name we should associate with the shock therapy reforms in Russia and then which was pretty much uh, taken as a model for other countries. But by, in, in his much later work, um, he wrote sort of in self-reflection on uh, what was going on. And uh, I think he pretty much used the term that institutions don't really grow as mushrooms after rain. And there were just, I think it's sort of trying to make point that the institutions needed foundation, they needed uh, uh, like institutions like private property, um, contractual laws, and, and so on, needed uh, nurturing, needed development, rather than just throwing it out there here, liberalize yourself kind of approach. And the competitive structure is also an important point because focus on expert-led growth has been dominant, uh, right, for quite a while. Uh, as, as the model of development, but we see in the development economics that sort of the traditional discussions, how it actually has limited prospects for countries developing. So maybe this crisis could be as sometimes we're told that there's an opportunity in every crisis, maybe something that um, uh, would help these countries reorient them, their economies in the future. Of course, one could say nothing will have changed, but everything will be new once we come out of this. And for small economies, it's really going to be the most difficult task. But I think there are two narratives to sum it up, really. The advanced economies, the stronger economies, right, will have this uh, sort of um, emphasis on building the national economies. And they have the capabilities to do so, that sort of reorienting global, reorienting global value chains, introducing automation, and labor substitution, labor saving technologies to boost production. Um, and then, but then it would still require uh, some type of uh, stronger public policy in terms of, uh, uh, you know, whichever you prefer, basic income or jobs guarantees or uh, training uh, 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 qualification, new, uh, helping people acquire new qualification, whatever that might be, but there will be a need for this just to sustain the capitalist economy as we know it. Right? So it's in the interest of preserving the capitalist economy to actually create those opportunities. And the smaller economies are facing much deeper challenges um, because on the one hand, there will, be, there will be a group that will try to search for integration uh, with the bigger economies or sort of the, the, their regionally with their neighbors, right? So we'll, to come out of this crisis. On the other hand, there may be attempts to become self-sufficient, but those will be very limited, especially in the economies that are um, disadvantaged as far as uh, geographic uh, locations and, and climate, right? So there's still going to be a risk of this vulnerability and uh, in this part of the world is going to be felt probably most dearly. But I'm hoping for the best and, you know, just saying hoping the best is probably not enough. What we need to hope is that we learn from the past and, let, and take some lessons from that. So this concludes my presentation and here's the shameless plug. Uh, there's more information on my website and I'm happy to take any questions. Very good, thank you very much for this uh, wonderful presentation, Alec. And for thank your you. patience with all the difficulties that we had at the beginning of this. Uh, I'm gonna open it to the, to the audience now. If you wanna ask a question, you may raise your hand. I guess uh, you are all familiar with the little utility that allows you to do that. Sometimes there are no questions. <laughs> I'm sure there'll be many. Oh, there is a- uh... Take some warming up. Let's go, Terence. Yeah, thanks. I'm just gonna ask a question because I have to go to another meeting in, in uh, like five minutes ago. <laughs> but one of the things you said, Dr. Georgian, was that the the system itself, pre 
didn't want to didn't have the technology uh, that they managed to come up to par with the Western Western economies. So my question was that I've I've been on this is a personal observation and also factual. Every business trip we had, there was defensive attitude by any republic from Soviets to Kazakhstan, you name it, that their technology, their knowledge, their education system, their professors, their technicians, their scientists are much better than ours, okay? And mm -hmm. they didn't had an open mind to accept the skills transfer, not skills purchase, but skills transfer, which is the easiest thing to do. I mean, the best example of that was at Fiat, when, it, when they went to make the Ladas in Russia, there was a big improvement in their knowledge. I mean, Lada still is the Lada, no matter how you look at it. When Pepsi Cola went there, it was a great drink. So part of the matter is that that little clue was skills transfer acceptance, welcoming it would solve a lot of problems. They were in denial not to accept that. Then I will go. Thank you very much. I, th I, think, I think you raise a valid point there. I mean, I cannot speak for the purposeful policy of being in denial. Um, but you're right, I th and, but the way I can explain this is really from perspective of keeping things running smoothly as, as they were. And maybe there's something at the local level because there, there are those examples that would be um, kind of, you have a system at uh, sort of the superstructure working fine, but at the local level, um, if the decision makers are not really opening up to uh, what, you, what you're saying, sort of new ideas and new technologies, because it's going to upset their world, their established view of the world, uh, or their uh, the, the established pattern of doing things. So it, it becomes to very micro, uh, uh, really, factors uh, explaining some of this, um, which talks about the inefficiencies of, of the system. Because if you introduce a progressive technology, then all of a sudden, your indicators turn out different than expected than last year or than what's planned. And that raises attention from the big center and then uh, sort of a del whole delegation comes in and you have to talk to them, explain to them what happened. And not always that was uh, appreciated. In other words, this communication from sort of the, the low ranks to the top ranks is part of the problem, but I think it's also a very corporate problem. They were very anymore. protective. They were very protective of their but, technology and knowledge. They did not accept our nomenclature or our standards. Even from the railway gauge onwards, let me look at that. But one thing, one thing in deference I will say, in observation, China took a different route. They studied the Russian system or the communist system in so USSR. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. They've taken the route whereby they opened the door and they welcomed, they copied, they got the skills transfer, they, they, they got the acknowledgement, and recognition as well as the contracts and all and voila here we are today thanks right. that's that's the principal reason explaining uh china's rights right but then what happens with it is history will show all right thank you for your question nice 10 by the way <laughs> thanks all right any other comments or questions or uh, contributions Hey, Alec, thanks. Uh, you, you did a fantastic job and, and good job dealing with all of the, uh, the hecklers and whatever. Um, on, on the last piece there, when you were talking about uh, the, the drive for self-sufficiency, um, how, I guess, you know, how, how realistic is that? I, I feel like all of these economies need to be integrated. Um, I mean, you know, you're, you're talking about very small economies, you know, the European Union has a couple of big drivers. And I've always thought that these, the central European economies are trying to jump in and, and get on the bus with the drivers. Mm -hmm. um, is there a big push for, for self sufficiency or, or just a niche, right, that this is this could be our niche? I think it will. It, I think it's going to start with a niche more of a sort of here's what we can do best. Here's our offering. Um, Poland in that regard may be winning, for example, in financial services. 
with a lot of banks relocating their staff out of London um, right. and, and, and that. Um, but this is where it becomes difficult to predict. Um, so sort of what happens in the bigger European economies will influence then what happens uh, further, f further east, right? Because, so it may become an involuntary move to search for some um, self-sufficiency. But it, obviously it cannot be 100% self-sufficiency, but uh, it may, well, it, there's also the political dimension and sort of the domestic society kind of views on um, kind of the, sort of the whole national project is very much more important over there, but I guess it's also common globally, but over there it's quite significant. And so it's kind of part of net being national pride that uh, here it is, we're, we're able to produce this, this and that. Um, and it's, for example, in the, um, in the production of masks and protective uh, equipment, right? Personal PPE these days, um, a lot of the factories have transferred into product producing that, right? And, and then with the 3D printing, the plastic uh, visors and shields, um, and uh, there've been quite, quite a few stories of that. And um, kind of that's per portrayed as, okay, here we go. We, if we can do this, we can probably do more things. Uh, to what extent it will be sustained, that's difficult to say. Again, uh, with, uh, I think to me, it's a function of what will be the um, impacts on the established supply chains. And so maybe I'm mixing too many things together, but I think they are interconnected with loss of jobs, with furloughs, right? And, and, and but still uh, the sort of relatively ongoing levels of consumption, right? Sustained levels of consumption. So things need to be produced. If the workers are not showing up because of the health reasons, then we need to automate. Well, if we automate, we probably don't need that much production to be spread out across Hungary, Poland, and so on. So that could be probably uh, moved back. But that means loss of jobs in those countries. And then again, social and political pressures. Uh, I guess it never stops. <laughs> yeah, and the, the, the sense of national pride and even regional pride, I mean, is oh, yeah. so deep. And, you know, I, I think about it from, you know, just being here in the United States and the, the you know, the talk of tribalism and, and all that, but it's, it's so much deeper in the places that I've been to in Central Europe, where it was, it was very shocking, you know, that uh, maybe shocking is the wrong word, but it, it very much stood out to me, the sense of, of regional pride and these are my people and, yeah, it's it's deep. Those institutions are deep. Yep. No, you're right. It, it is shocking uh, because you know one thing being in the United States, it's one thing, but also being in the 21st century, living in the 21st century, you would think that those questions would be a little bit more, you know, kind of uh, yeah, important, but not really the the, the determining <laughs> principles, but they are. And that's why I emphasize history so much. Yeah. But, um, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rick, for the question. And uh, any other comments or uh, questions? No. Yes. Go ahead, Norm. Hi. Hi. Um, thank you very much. I, I just wanted to ask two, two issues um, from the late 70s to the 80s. One was the, Afga the, the invasion of Afghanistan, mm -hmm. and, and which, which I, I had you know, been, maybe that's because of, the way interpretations are, that that was supposed to be major. And the other thing was the um, deal they made, the Soviets made, uh, for, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure if this is accurate, grain, they traded, because they had a bad harvest, they made a deal with to get grain in exchange for letting this, the uh, Jewish people leave, emigrate from there. Oh. And um, I'm, I'm wondering if there was that, the impact of those two things, whether that, you know, whether that's... <clears throat> what the, right. So, um... What would you like me to say? I mean, I, I can comment on the grain part for sure. Okay. Afghanistan, I mean, any war is a bad war. It's not, is there's no uh, way to justify it, in my opinion. My grandfather was in World War II. He met up with the Americans in Berlin. 
and all I know is that he cried every moment he talked about the war. Um, so, um, and the Afghan war was really, you know, there's one way how it was portrayed, but maybe going back to Tolstoy's uh, quote, uh, every family suffered uh, from that uh, in, in different ways because, you know, I mean, we are having communications difficulties now, but back then it was there were days, weeks, and months that would sort of people would be taken out of because it was conscription, right? People would be taken out of relatively stable, peaceful society, and all of a sudden find themselves in the midst of war. Maybe it's a similar shock that was experienced in the Iraqi wars and for many soldiers coming from here. So I'm against wars. Now on the grain, <laughs> that was indeed. Uh, one of those, um, I, don't, I don't know, secrets or uh, little known uh, pieces of history, right? That um, if we, you know, the countries, Russia and Russia, Kazakhstan, Ukraine, and Belarus to some extent, sort of the largest producers of agriculture would be importing um, actually uh, grain and other products, also poultry and meat products from Canada and the United States in the midst of the Cold War. So, um, yes, that was, that also, coinc that was also, coin I mean, co it happened at the same time with uh, large Jewish immigration. And right? so we have Brighton Beach part of partially, thanks. To, to well, I was thinking of what, what, what the, whether it was, because the, the, a lot of people I know, they were scientists, my friends, mother was a nuclear scientist. I mean, yeah. the type of drain of technology with that emigration that came out of the Soviet Union also. Oh, we've got Sergey Green is his name, one of the co-founders of Google. Oh, that's <laughs> that's part of that. There you, go. <laughs> so you could say it was for the benefit of humanity. Uh, <laughs> a lot of them also went to Wall Street, mathematicians. Oh yes, so yep. a lot of and engineers, mathematicians, financial engineers. So that's the thing, right? That so this goes back to uh, Terence's question before about technology. That this whole the concept of change was difficult to accept because it would change the established way of doing things, and uh, but at the same time there was realization that somehow you know, we you had to do something. So that's where a lot of people were technically allowed to leave yeah, because there was all by permission yep. to travel anywhere. Well, my friend's mother was a nuclear scientist and they delayed, they wouldn't let her go for, you know, of course. Yeah, a couple of years. She may yeah. have known something. She came here and, and, and sold shoes, I think. <laughs> <laughs> There's a, there are a couple of researchers at Northeastern University who are studying the, diaspora, the Soviet diaspora in, in the United States and they've written a couple of books uh, basically doing surveys and um, sort of these type of um, learning from um, from individuals about their experiences and this is a very common story I I mean I've met people who were and this is now in the, talking about the 90s immigration and to the early 2000s who were uh, qualified uh, surgeons they would do heart surgeries I'm not a medical doctor but basically those complicated things that we only was uh, you know, that we so we obviously know cannot do, but um, they come here and they open up bakeries because they need to survive. Because on the other hand, when people like that come and say they come in their middle age or, or relatively, not in the very young age, it's very difficult to adjust to the new system, right? Um, doctors need to pass the U USMLE, I think it's called, right? Certifications. And that's a very lengthy pr process. If you come with a family of children, you have to sacrifice your career goals for basic survival. I guess New York City is really exemplary in that case because this is where you get PhD taxi drivers, or at least when the yellow cabs were still the thing. That's very true. <clears throat> I'm privileged to have caught some of that. <laughs> Those are the best conversations, really. Yep. Uh -huh. Any other questions or comments? There's some, there's uh, Yes, yeah. I, yeah, go ahead. Hi, Professor. Um, Hi. So my question has more to do with 
the institutional development or framework. Um, so I think I would argue, and I think a lot of people would agree that this pandemic is a critical juncture in that it um, might exacerbate small differences between countries globally, politically and economically. Um, we've seen that countries of the former Soviet Union and those of Central and Eastern Europe um, have made very uh, varied and mixed transition from um, autocratic institutions and centrally planned economy toward some combination of free markets um, and some improvement of institutions like control of corruption, rule of law, uh, democratic accountability. Do you see this crisis um, creating some sort of like divergence or difference between countries in terms of their institutional progress? Right. Um, whenever I get questions such as this, I always get confused. I'm not a political scientist to, <laughs> to easily throw this model or that model. As Branko Milanovic once exclaimed on Twitter, it's great that we talk about democracy, but show me a real one, not a theoretical one. So uh, to me, it's all very relative. And that's why I brought up the, those three kind of arrows, those three points that talk about how do people feel? What, are, what is the, the economy, sort of the structure of the economy? And institutionally, it's not just about um, sort of the centralization of resources or what you said, autocratic, um, but it's also about the accepted norms, right? So for example, in that respect, those countries like Central Europe for sure, Eastern Europe, you can include in that also even, uh, so you can include Russia, you can include uh, the Georgia, Armenia, they're very capitalist in terms of their approach um, of um, sort of starting business. Georgia is ranked one of the top five, I believe, uh, or at least top 10 on the World Bank's uh, global uh, world ease of doing business report, right? Um, so it's very simple. Um, um, what we have though, of course, and then undeniably, I would call this as a difference in accents. <laughs> and that is that in some countries we see governments that are more pronounced and more actively um, interfering in the economy. But there is a reason for that. Okay? And, and the reason is not for necessarily for the purpose of the government to control certain resources or not, I don't have that information. But the way I understand it is the reason for the government to appear as accountable to uh, sort of to the general public, right? Because again, when I talk about history and legacy, it is still very dominant and there's still very strong view that, uh, especially in the former Soviet Union countries, that the government is responsible for creating job opportunities. And so that pretty much necessitates for the government to be more vocal about what they're doing. Um, so again, this is where I'm, I'm always uneasy when we just jump to e simple conclusions um, as far as an economist really, are just, I mean, it, it makes a really good empirical model and maybe a publication when you say, okay, here's an index of a government's certain accountability or corruption and uh, here's, um, let's say, GDP per capita, and, and it all works out well, but it's not that simple of a story. So this does not uh, reduce the need to um, keep an eye on what's going on, obviously, because you know, I'm not that way, you know, we're not trying to justify any of inadequacies, but all I'm saying is that in some countries, uh, th there's a stronger need for the government to be more visible and more active. Um, and what I was talking about before in terms of economic development, there's also um, um, an observation that at the early stages of development, which in some cases we are here because they've been going through so many uh, disruptions, um, a government, a pragmatic government can play an instrumental role in, in setting the sort of the foundation for growth and then okay, releasing it uh, uh, and further. That's my long answer. Um, thank you. Someone said thank you. Oh, thank you, Sean. And someone else said thank you, Richard. Thank you. That was great. Any other questions?
Okay. Right? Well, you have to buy the book now. <laughs> <laughs> Good advertisement. And this is the best time to do it because it's on discount. Oh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> Um, but um, on uh, no, but seriously, there are some other talks that I've that that I have on the website, and um, you know you don't have to buy the book there. It's at the libraries, but um, also there, are, you know, just uh, some reviews. And I'm working on right now some, on summarizing. So if you're interested, maybe we can distribute this through Ibrahim. Um, on summarizing the impact of the crisis um, on these countries. But it's going to be a short write-up, so it should be easy, relatively easy to follow. But thank you very much for sticking with us and for your questions and your patience. Um, please stay in touch. Thank you very much. And uh, if you need the video, because I have recorded the session, just send me an email, education at sgss.org. I'll be happy to share it with you. Thank you. OK, thank you, Ibrahima. Thanks for the invitation and the opportunity. To talk. Pleasure. As always. Yeah, thank you. It was great. All right, thanks. Bye. Okay, bye everyone. Thanks. It was good seeing you, Alec. Good seeing you. Bye, Rick. <laughs>